Very good morning to everyone present. A very good morning to everyone present here. I am Yash Sharma, a fourth year BALB student, and I welcome you all to the webinar on law reforms in India towards victim justice and victim compensation, being organized by DME Law School. Today we have with us Honorable Chief Guest Professor Dr. Nirmal Kanti Chakrabarti, Sir Vice Chancellor, West Bengal. National University of Juridical Sciences in Kolkata, who has taken off his busy schedule to deliver this lecture for us. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Dr. Ravi Kant Swami, sir, uh, Director DME, Professor D uh, Dr. Rashmi Nagpal, ma'am, Dean DME Law School, Professor Dr. Bhavesh Gupta, sir, Head of Academics, DME Law School, and Dr. Rajinder Radhava, ma'am, Academic coordinator DME Law School to the event. I welcome all the participants and I'm sure that today's event will help everyone present here in enriching their experience and gaining valuable knowledge on this theme. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce the epitome of legal fraternity, Justice B.R. Krishna Iyer, in whose memory we conduct this lecture series. Justice B.R. Krishna Iyer was an Indian judge who became a pioneer of judicial activism. He pioneered the legal aid movement in the country. He stood up for the poor and underprivileged and remained a huge human rights champion, a crusader for social justice and the environment and a doyen of civil liberties throughout his life. It is in his memory that we conduct this lecture. We are extremely honored to have with us Visionary Scholar of Law, Professor Dr. Nirmal Kanti Chakrabarti, Sir, Vice Chancellor, West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata, as the Chief Guest of this event. I would now request Honorable Professor Dr. Rashmi Nagpal, ma'am, Dean DME Law School, to kindly introduce the speaker. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Yash. Thank you so much. Very good morning to one and all present. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And it's an honor and a pleasure, our privilege to have Professor N.K. Chakrabarti, Vice Chancellor, West Bengal National University of Jerusalem, with us today. We know the kind of busy schedule all Vice Chancellors have. So thank you so much and warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, a small thing that I would like to share before I, uh, sir, those are needs no introduction uh, formally is a well-known figure, but sir, George Bernard Shaw said once, if you have an apple and I have an apple and we exchange the apple, would mean you have one apple and I have one apple. And if you have an idea, exchange of that idea would mean I have two ideas and you have two ideas. So the purpose of conducting uh, the Justice Krishna Iyer lecture series is precisely this only. This exchange of ideas leads to many new innovations, many new things and enlightening the minds of each and everyone. Our faculty, we are all the students of law. So learning is all through uh, that we get from uh, the eminent speakers. Dr. Chakraborty worked as director, School of Law, KIIT University for over a decade, University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata in 2019. As a prolific writer, Dr. Chakraborty has so far authored eight books. He has also published more than 100 articles and research papers in various national and international journals. Dr. Chakraborty has established himself as a researcher in the field of criminology and criminal justice in India. He has contributed five sponsored research projects and three collaborative projects of Ministry and of Law and Justice. Ford Foundation, World Justice Project of ABA USA, UNDP, UGC, ICR, ICSSR, etc. In 2001, Indian Society of Criminology conferred fellowship to Dr. Chakravarti for his contribution in the field of criminology. In 2017, Professor Chakravarti has been awarded Professor K. Chokalingam Award by Indian Society of Victimology for his contribution to victimology in India. 
He was the president of Indian Society of Victimology from 2011 to 2014 and was awarded a research scholarship by Max Planck Institute of Foreign and International Criminal Law, Feuerberg, Germany in 2017 and 18. Thank you so much, sir, to be with us today. We are, it's indeed a pleasure and over to you, sir. Thank you, and it is my pleasure very good morning to all present in this virtual lecture in memory of uh, Justice B.R. Krishnamaya. In fact, uh, the name in my mind or heart, Justice Krishnamaya is so deep that I had no courage to say no for any program connected with Justice Krishnamaya. In fact, uh, my most valuable publications, Administration of Criminal Justice, Correctional Services in five volume, forwarded by on Justice B.R. Krishnaya. So great, but so simple. First, it required one minute request to him when I met him first time physically in Bangalore in 1992. So great that immediately he asked me what are the object of publishing this book. I told that it is my aim to make the reformative justice in India, which you for the first time in the Supreme Court asserted in your various judgment to popularize that idea. He immediately accepted that. So I am late to Justice B.R. Kishmaya. I think to me, the humanist judge, the champion of human rights, and most reformist in the apex court in the country post-independence. I have not seen any other judge who has the courage to change the traditional principle of justice. Most of the judgments delivered by Justice B.R. Kishnoir, mainly on that, not only the human rights of the accused, but also the victims. And in the present immunological thinking, it is victim justice that is much funding also. So I have chosen the towards big compensation. In fact, what is compensation in perspective of today's victimology? It means I mean the law sustained and it tries to counterbalance the suffering and the law suffered as a result of victimization. It may be said in other words that it carries with an idea of making whole or giving an equivalent or substantive material payment to one party and there is no relation to any advantage to any other party. Now, this being the philosophy behind this compensatory jurisprudence in victimology, there is other reasoning for which this victim justice compensation developed in the world today. The first one is but there is a need of social insurance, every citizen. The state adopted welfare measure. Now, under the welfare measure, the state to come forward for injured for the sufferers. So this compensatory jurisprudence in other way is a welfare measure by the state. And above all, 
it is an obligation of all the states to keep the citizen protection and if there is any way of aberration of that duty governmental obligation which we expected from all the governments in that case the state to look after and to pay compensation to the victim if we go to the history of compensation in the legal framework we should first mention the even the declaration 1985 and before that 1985 in 1975 the world society of victimology in japan movement was started and ultimately the nation after 10 years of struggle movements and international demands conferences and it was an independent our criminal justice system either accusatorial or inquisitorial mainly focused on accused based accused based not on that movement ultimately 1985 when declared that basic rights of the victims <coughs> under this un declaration 1985 there are five components one is access to justice other is fair treatment third is restitution fourth is compensation and fifth is assistance i am taken only compensation part to make the indian progress on victimology and more because it is the philosophy that reflected in the judgments of justice b r krishnar and followed by others in the court in indian law prior to even declaration 1985 there are glimpses or seeds of compensation in criminal procedure code section 357 1 2 and 3 there is a provision of compensation by court in compensation by court it is provided that the accused is punished with sentence of fine or her fine is formed a part of sentence or where a person is entitled to recover damages from convict to fine the court can award compensation so at the initial stage prior to 1985 when united nation declared that compensation is the obligation of the state before that it was at the court the court has to pay compensation for the fine is one of the part of the sentence and from that fine the court can add compensation or there are damages so to recover damages court can award compensation similarly in section 358 prior to 1985 we had glimpses of compensation whenever any person causes any other person to be groundlessly arrested and magistrate may award compensation to the extent of rupees 1000 only which in our tort law we normally call malicious prosecution but the compensation is very very meager considering the present situation Similarly, there is Section 359 CRTC, where appellate court, high court, or the court of session can order penalty in cases of non-cognizable offences and costs incurred due to prosecution. So this is also from the court. But what the concept now is not of the court; it is from the 
state in 237 C of CNPC, court of session, <coughs> takes cognizance of an offense under section 199 and found that there lacks reasonable ground, court may order to pay compensation not exceeding 1,000. So compensation was there, but that was not which we think today under the UN Declaration 1985, the victim compensation. Even in Supreme Court, <coughs> some cases the victims compensation jurisprudence we have noticed the judiciary also before 1985 or before the 2008 amendment of criminal procedure to do sometimes civil compensation to the victims or the injured party or whose rights being infringed compensation by the inherent power of the court. And Deem Singh, Sunil Bhatkar versus of Delhi, Ajayab Singh versus of Punjab, Supra Chakravarti versus, uh, uh, and also that 125 CRPC Supra Chakravarti versus Bodhisattva Bhutta. Even Nodhinesat Prati versus of Odisha also. We have noticed that there are compensatory jurisprudence introduced in our Supreme Court by way of extra or we can say inherent jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Therefore, prior to victim justice UN declaration, we have judicial lawmaking and prior to our present under CRPC 2018 and 2013, and also to some extent, Juvenile Justice Act 2015. There are various ways victim compensation or victim justice incorporated in our legal system. In fact, the word victim was not in our legal framework. For the first time in 2008 criminal law reforms or criminal procedure code amendment act 2008, which came into force in 2010. First time victim word being used. Section 2WA defined victim. Victim under CRPC is a person who suffers loss or injury which is caused to him by any act or omission for who is the person who is accused has been charged. So it is to be noted that it is not the conviction. It is if a person or if offense committed, crime committed, there is an investigation report and court take cognizance and charge it fine. In that case, the victim acquired the rights of compensation whether the case proved or it has been acquitted. If there is a charge sheet filed, immediately the victim acquired the rights of compensation and rights of compensation from the state. Similarly, there is section 24 Office or advice. That is the prosecution. We know that all criminal cases, the state public prosecutor is to appear before the court as prosecution. <coughs> but this 24 8 has one per right to the victim past and choose his or her own advocate. That is also available in other jurisdiction other countries also. Similarly, Section 372 of CRPC, victim has right 
for engaged an advocate against an order of the subordinate court if the order is lesser or inadequate compensation. So if the compensation awarded by the lower court or the court trial court is inadequate or less what is expected by the victim, then the victim has a right to engage his or her separate advocate. But the 1985 UN Declaration on Victim Justice, that the state under its own obligation to pay compensation invoked in 2008 amendment by adding 357A, where it is said the state government in coordination with central government is obliged to prepare a victim compensation scheme. <clears throat> And district and state legal service authorities shall decide the amount of compensation as per the recommendation of the court. And there is also first aid medical facilities that to be extended to the victims of crime. This victim compensation scheme, as recommended by the court, is subsequently after 2008. All, almost all the state, except few, they prepare their victim compensation scheme. It is not required now the what amount to be paid for that the legal service authority to go to court. There is victim compensation scheme declared by almost all the state government under this 357A. 357B is there. For compensation be paid under 357A, that to be paid in addition to the fine paid in 326A acid attack or under the substance of my compensation, but compensation with 357A is A, B provided, it is in addition to that acid attack and gang rape compensation in the law itself. There is another very <laughs> state is an obligation or private hospitals also an obligation to compulsory provide immediate free medical aid to the victims of offenses under section 326A, that is acid attack, and all types of rapes, and then inform the police. So in case of rape and acid attack, government hospital as well as private hospital under statutory obligation to provide immediate free medical aid. But in fact, it is not known to people. Normally, people go to state hospital, but it is provided the state or private hospital, both under the law, under the CRPC, bound to give free medical aid to victims of rape or victims of acid attack. Besides CRPC, we have Section 5 of the Provisional Offenders Act, which provides that when an accused being released under Provision of Offenders Act, under Section 5, the court may award, in addition to grant of benefit of provision, compensation to the victim. We know that in motor vehicles also, accident victim, various three types of all motor accidents, compensation is a right. Similarly, in case of protection of women from domestic violence at 2005, there is compensation provision remedy given under the Act. So, besides CRPC, we have other legislation also. Compensation was also provided by the legislature. <clears throat> besides this, we have 
administrative order under the central government. These are security related expenditure. The victims at the hands of noxalites. Under the present scheme of yeah. <coughs> government of India, 76 district of seven states, they are, if there is a victims in the hands of noxalites, the National Foundation for Communal Harmony fund is provided by the government of India for victims of violence under noxalites or communal riots <coughs> or violence on caste or ethnic issues. This is administrative order, but this has force of law. Moreover, the central victim compensation schemes being along with the state being extended to give relief and rehabilitation of the rape victims. And because every state frame their compensation scheme according to their financial capacity. Somewhere it is 50,000, somewhere 1 lakh, somewhere 2 lakhs. So the balance amount, what under the central victim compensation scheme for the rape victims, that they fix one amount that every state from the central fund make it equal so that there would be equality of compensation among the rape victims. But the problem is, I, I told you that 20 states, they notified victim compensation scheme, but these are all almost different from one to other. This was brought to notice of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court about this, that compensation which it gives adequate. So central government steps into <laughs> to differences. Central government under Ministry of Home Affairs issued a circular of each state government which is popularly known as CBC, Central Victim Compensation Scheme, introduced with effect from 14th October 2015. In, from 6 July 2016, Central Victim Compensation Scheme tried to develop the uniform and to some extent equalize the compensation to the victims of crime. <laughs> now if we now compare our Indian team compensation with other countries, it will get types of system. One for compensation given by the state only like Australia, Canada, Denmark, France, Sweden, United Arab Emirates, for compensation given by the state only. But there are countries where compensation is Austria, Belgium. But there are other countries, including India, where who is to pay compensation, there is no bar that it can be by the accused as well as the state. Like 357, accused court can award compensation and it to be paid by the accused. Similarly, there is 357A for state to pay compensation. Such type of compensation for both state as well as accused to pay compensation, we can see from Colombia, Germany, Spain, Czechoslovakia, Portugal, Switzerland, and include so in India. In scenario. Uh, sorry to pause you, sir. Actually, okay. the internet is a little unstable. I need to hear you properly. So, can you hear us? I am hearing it. Okay, it's, it's a little better now, sir. sir. Okay. So, what actually 
we have seen that though many states, almost 20 states started victim compensation scheme, the allocation of fund is so meager that whole amount is not being paid to the victims. Two, three research studies are already being completed where it has been seen that only maybe 25% or 50% compensation given, others not yet given, they are waiting for two years, three years to get the compensation. So on the one hand, there are provisions in the law that victims having right to compensation to be paid by the state legal service authority or district legal service authority. But due to paucity of fund or the allocation of adequate budget in the state, this rights of getting compensation is not fully realized by the victims. So what we can say in conclusion, that there is a trends of recognition of need to pay the law by amending or reforming our law. And it is more and more on rights based that victims having these rights of compensation, rights to appoint advocate, rights to appeal for more compensation, and rather than the court. But in reality, what rights in confer? Their victims are not getting enjoying the, all the rights that is being conferred in law. So there is a gap or conflict between the law and the reality. We have the compensatory jurisprudence, victim justice rights. We have to go long hours to make it realize in the reality. Thank you. Any open for questions? <laughs> All right, Yash, I think we can move on to one of the questions. Um, thank you so much, sir, for the insightful understanding that you shared with us today. Uh, now, we would like to invite questions from the audience. If you have any, you may please direct it towards me in the chat box. Uh, <coughs> So actually, uh, there is one question uh, that, uh, like, what are the steps that the Indian government can take in order to provide better victim justice? Uh, what is actually the way forward, sir? What are the, what are the steps that the Indian government can take in uh, to provide better victim justice? To my mind, instead of this victim compensation scheme, which is now asks that state legal service authority, district legal service authority to pay compensation under the state victim compensation scheme. I think like a central victim compensation scheme should be there. There should not be every state a different one because that, that affects our constitutional right of equality also. A victim in Delhi gets a two lakhs and a victim getting on the scheme same offense or crime, one lakh rupees in other state may be That is a discrimination, which is not within the legal framework of our constitution permitted. So I think the central government, whatever may be the capacity that that's the only option scheme, instead of leaving it to the state, that makes differences among the victims. So a central scheme by amendment, it is not that the state should declare a composition victims. Thank you so much, sir. So just uh, one last question, sir. Uh, so can we learn from the US model of restorative justice? What can India do to apply better restorative justice measures in law? In fact, restorative justice 
model which is very much prevalent in USA. We have tried to some extent through our plea bargaining system introduced in CRPC. But the problem is that neither the prosecution nor the defense or even police, because these three along with the victims and accused required to consent for plea bargaining and at the same time a agreeable sentencing. Along with that, there is a problem in our see that the court can ask for even now <coughs> that even criminal courts can be now to some extent high court settling in the mediation also. But the problem is the profession is not ready to accept this model. Maybe there is a fear that if we accept restorative justice, so we have to bring together the victims as well as the accused. So there may be that cases which are pending 10 years or more. That will, within two years, three years, it can be just after recognizance and trial starts, it can be risked to have a restorative justice system. To my mind, the problem is our legal profession, particularly the advocates, lawyers. They have the misconception about restorative justice. That's why if criminal justice system, when we are saying it is a system, it depends upon certain pillars. So lawyers is also both defense and prosecution. They are the one of the pillars of our administration of justice. If they are not ready, only from court, we can't implement this restorative justice. Definitely, it has the need in our justice system, particularly criminal justice system. But our <coughs> profession is not ready and government or legislature not taking risks that they will be provision, but that will not be adhered to, like our plea bargaining. I have studied two states where not any plea bargaining being operation. That means if people are not accepting a reform, then only by parliament we can't change the system. So restorative justice is a very much welcome particularly Indian society, a big population, a very big hydrated justice system where it, if introduced, could have been very much benefited to the accused and the victims, but it is unfortunately not accepted like our plea bargaining. That's why legislature is fearing to brought into this restorative justice in law. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have got, received one more question, sir. Uh, are there any changes that can be made in trial proceedings of India? Like any other further positive changes? Yes, positive change. One can be that like in some cases now, CPC, it is some cases it is provided like family court, for example. That Family court first try for a mediation, <coughs> conciliation and mediation. Similarly, if it is said that after cognizance of the criminal cases, if it is a compulsory, the first every case, there should be an attempt by order of the court that all the parties, victims, accused, the investigating officer, defense counsel, and the prosecution, they will sit and attempt to settle the case by plea bargaining, which is very much used in USA. If a compulsory things, few days back, our Chief Justice of 
India, the CND Ramana in one seminar commented that Indian legislature should think a compulsory mediation. mediation. Unless we need compulsory wish of the court and the lawyers and the police, I think it is unexpected and it is normally not to be accepted. There are some reasons also a separate study can be done. But our existing, some of the agencies of criminal justice not accepting. So only which I am also of same view, Justice, Chief Justice of India comment that there may be compulsory mediation by amendment of the law by the parliament. So, so this is just uh, the one last question, sir. Uh, sir, is there any right to privacy uh, to the rape survivors in relation to victim justice given? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, right to privacy, <coughs> I think definitely under constitution it is in victims of rape there is privacy and in matters of that's why in the process of justice particularly victim of rape there are protections given to the victim in our criminal procedure court that protections are for the rights of uh, privacy rights of the victim this under our Article 19, it is recognized. For the Sami case, it is elaborated broadly. Uh, thank you, sir, for addressing our questions. Uh, with this, we move on to the end of the event. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Bedpriya Lahiri, ma'am, Assistant Professor, DMA Law School, for the vote of thanks. Please. So Just a one minute uh, I have to acknowledge that I am suffering from cold and cough, but in spite of that, because it is Justice Kishnar name, I can't say to defer again. Once I had to, so I think the students and faculties bear with me with my some problem of cold and cough. Somehow I completed. Okay, thank you all. Uh, no issue, no issue, sir. No issue about that. Uh, quite clear and quite honorable. Yes, sir. Yes. sir so, uh, first and foremost, I would like heartily like to thank you, sir, for sparing time out of your busy schedule, for responding to all my mails, and for delivering such a productive and knowledgeable address as you did today, sir. We are very, very thankful for this. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Rashmi Nathwal, ma'am our team, DME Law School, and Dr. Bhavish Gupta, sir, who is the head of academics, for their support, constant guidance in organization of this program. To the co-convener and my colleague, Nishri Ma'am, and the team of Yash and Sri Lakshmi for their assistance in this smooth conduct. And of course, to the wonderful student audience who was there here in such large number, and they participated in this event. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. You. We'd love to have you physically, sir, whenever the situation okay. is good. We'll, uh, uh, tell you. It'll be an honor to have you here physically in the campus. I hope that next year, maybe 2022, we have a physical program. Yes, sir. We are yes, also sir. waiting yes. for <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. So with this, we have come to the end of the event. Uh, students, you may please fill in the attendance form and then you can leave the lecture.